to an interactive session called Tiny Dreams, Eco Media and Small File Web Art. The Small File Media Festival um, is, our, is sorry. <laughs> this is an interactive workshop with uh, representatives from the Small File Media Festival on creating small footprint and small file web art. We have Joni, a web designer, artist, and arts organizer, and Yanni, a manager for Small File Media Festival. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Um, I just wanted to start by saying this um, presentation is in the form of a website. Uh, if you want to open it on the local network, these are the credentials here. Uh, I'm just going to leave them up. Louder? Okay, okay. I can project. I can project. Um, these are the credentials to log in here if you go to your file browser, uh, file manager, and enter the backslash archives.local backslash share. Enter the credentials, and you can access this in the tiny folder. Yeah, yeah. It's but it's small. It's really small, <laughs> <laughs> which is our point. But <laughs> it's really hard to see. <laughs> Why am I not? Uh... Are you all able to join the local network and see on your own screen? Tell us how to join the local network, Joni. Uh, it's if you can, can you read it no. at all? <laughs> so the local network, our network's local and is written on the wall here. Yes. Local host forward slash tiny forward slash index dot HTML. Is that more legible? Can you read this? Uh, yeah, so once again in the file browser backslash archives.local backslash share or the IP address here and then the username is rnets and the password is sunflower if it asks. And there's a folder in there called tiny. If you just open the index file in there in your browser, you can uh, open this on your own system but I'll also show it here so not a big deal. Uh, I just want to make sure, can everybody still uh, read this? Yes. Take that as yes. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks everybody for coming. My name's Joni, uh, as Don said, this is uh, Yanni. We both are representing Small File Media Festival today. Um, I'm a uh, kind of jack of all trades. Uh, I do web development, web design. Uh, I, of course, do uh, events, engagement, and other such tasks for Small File. We have a festival coming up in October. Um, amongst other arts administrative work and arts programming work. Uh, and I will let Yanni introduce herself and sort of get started on the first few sections. We're going to talk about the Small File Media Festival and what small files are and what they mean for, um, for uh, data communications and the environment. Hi, everyone. Yanni, it's really nice to meet you. Um, I met Don, who is one of the co-organizers of this festival um, in 2020, when we were put together for this very kind of unusual, local first, kind of low carbon writers workshop. And through this meetup, we worked together on the telephone and through shared kind of like Word document, we, we wrote an article together that kind of thought through um, some of our ideas about what it means to network in this period. Um, and it's funny because this, uh, this is all, all the writings that came out of this workshop are ending up in a low carbon research methods textbook. And it's funny because we had to really think about what it means to network in that moment. And our peer review keeps saying, um, they, they keep saying it's a little bit too COVID focused. But it is funny how in that kind of acute moment, we really had to think about what it means to network and what it means to network sustainably. Um, and at the same time, so I work in contemporary art. I just uh, finished my PhD, and my area is more thinking through aesthetic philosophy. But I had been thinking about what it means to work through um, periods of emergency. And uh, I got interested in digital ecology and small files because it strikes me as a, a kind of intervention that really thinks about what material is present and tries to work with it in a sustainable method. 
Um, so just in the last couple of months, I've taken on the role as managing director of the Small File Media Society. Um, and we've just become a not-for-profit society. But for the last five years, we've been putting on a festival of cinema or small file cinema, um, which in the last three years has become an in-person festival. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the festival before Joni really starts to think, t walk us through different types of uh, small file web art. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about what we do. So our goal as the Small File Media Society is to raise awareness of the carbon footprint of the internet, working with artists who experiment with media uh, that is produced or that rather that streams at a low bit rate. So our organization intervenes in this rising carbon footprint through the creation and dissemination of what we're calling small file ecomedia, which are low bandwidth moving image media that streams at an average of 1.44 megabytes per minute, which we kind of came up with because it is the size of a traditional floppy disk. So generally a small file is something that does not exceed these parameters. So if you send us uh, an entry to the Small File Media Festival, if it's not within these compression means of 1.44 megabytes a minute of duration, then we won't accept your film or we won't be able to unless you go back to the uh, drawing board and recompress. Um, these small files can be, they are mostly films, and that is what we tend to show at our festival, but it's also a wide range of media art, um, HTML, submis HTML submissions, sometimes NFTs, and executable files. And then we found that recently our best results, the best media art that we're receiving, is media art that's produced with obsolete technology. Which kind of unsurprisingly, when Don and I were writing our article together, when we were looking back at different network uh, solutions, and actually kind of not unlike some of the different ideas that Lori proposed to us today, it finds that we're constantly looking backwards for what people were doing when there was less to work with, and seeing in what ways those are still successful. Um, so in fact, like we had a number of submissions this year which were really, really cool, made with like a Tyco toy camera. Somebody used a Fisher Price camera. And these are yielding some really interesting results. So this project is intended to share our creative methods with makers. Um, and we are, we've had some significant funding this year, some interest from the federal government. So um, we are able to share this information with artist-run centers educational institutions such as universities and colleges, different communications, and we're expanding across Canada, but also internationally um, in places like Cairo and Beirut, because we want to work with areas that have lower infrastructure to create media that travels more lightly. Um, so then since 2020, we started to host the festival um, and that streamed online for the first two years because of COVID. We worked with Vimeo to try to have um, these kind of light streaming online festivals. And then now we're in our fifth year and we're hosted at the Cinematheque. Um, and that's really a celebration of media art that works with this small file limitation. Um, and then our goal is to propose alternative solutions for different forms of media practice. So the festival, <laughs> sorry, the festival, or rather, not the festival, but our environmental dilemma, I wanna say a little bit more about that. Um, so we are responding to this crisis that we see, which is posed by the electricity consumption of information and communication technology. And I'm sure you all are super familiar, but for anybody who is new to this term, ICT, it encompasses devices, data servers, wireless networks, video conferencing, and the internet more broadly. Um, and the basis of our work is um, founded by the research, uh, or rather the research of our founder, Laura U. Marks. Um, 
who in 2021, she worked with a group of engineers um, at SFU and other places uh, to survey 22 ranging studies um, who have uh, ICT electrical outputs. And then she also worked on, like she also surveyed the seven studies, I guess there was only seven at that moment, on streaming video specifically. And then in 2022, she, with Stefan Mackinnon, developed a far carbon footprint calculator for ICT. So Marx and Mackinnon, through this research that they did together, corroborated this kind of controversial statistic, which came out in 2018 by the SHIFT project, which is a French think tank. Um, and they, they all sort of agreed that, roughly speaking, that the carbon footprint of ICT is 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And we want to say that that's roughly the same as the airline industry. Um, some measurements are saying that it's actually twice the amount of the airline industry, so, um, because airline is something like 2%. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's two. Um, and then the current most recent measurement is also saying that ICT is 4.8. So, and this is kind of like rapidly increasing. The issue with this ICT calculation is that it's very controversial because scientists and engineers can't seem to agree on what is the system boundary. So um, what is the system boundary of the internet? It really asks whether or not our devices, data centers, production that ultimately feeds this industry, the disposal, the mining of metals, does this all fit into the system boundary of information communication technology. Sorry, I'm breathless now. <laughs> um, so we understand our project as something like a movement or something like a tactical method in art making, but we contextualize our work within the fine arts. Um, so we study its aesthetic properties in addition to its environmental impact. And I'm gonna show you some examples um, in a moment. But um, I'll say a little bit about small file movies as a way to prepare you for what you'll see, which is, that, which is to think of them as different than their large file counterparts um, because they don't share in the same luxury of 4K HD. Um, they're shows that have smooth visuals, the large K ones are, um, that run in principle, if not in practice, without glitch with narrative arcs that you can easily identify with. Small file cinema constitutes kind of what we think as like a radical new aesthetic practice born of this environmental necessity and really a product of formal experimentation of what you can do when you start to take data away. Um, so we encourage artists to begin by filming with lower resolution. Um, and to pay attention to things like shape, color, and movement, um, and prioritize this over something like content, necessarily. Um, because the aim is to get something that is still a visually satisfying image. And then, if we're working with sound, we're suggesting that people record in mono um, to save file space to decrease camera movement and movement within the frame, as well as to use shallow focal length. Um, so that to, to understand that we're trying to reduce first so that when images emerge from compression, they can still look fairly crisp. Um, and then the idea is that compression here becomes not a tiresome necessity, but a kind of medium on its own. So we work with artists using some free programs like Handbrake or any video converter um, to, so that people can choose or figure out how to maximize fidelity. Um, what else do I want to say? I'll, I'll say a little bit more if you have questions, but what I'll do is I'll show you an exper uh, a couple of small files. So this is the first year that we ran the festival. This was the winner of our small file mini bear. It won the whole show. 
Um, the maker is Han Pham, um, local to Vancouver. They are already a totally skilled filmmaker. Um, this was, this is called Once Upon a Time. It's, a, it's kind of an interesting log of the artist's time during the early days of the pandemic. Do you want to play, is it playing already? <coughs> Do we have sound? It does, it does help to have sound. <laughs> Funny how that works. What platform is this? This one is an MP4. Um, are we playing? Huh, it's going so slowly. <laughs> Without, audio. Without audio, yeah. Just check. What's the size of the MP4 file? Say this again? What's the size of the MP4 file for you to watch? This was, I actually don't have the specs for it, but I can find out for you. It's a 1.44 megabit. In fact, actually, like with the year that Han Pham submitted this film, we are actually working on a one megabyte per minute. Um, so that would be the format. Like the symbolism of 1.44 is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. We love the floppy disk, which Joni's going to show us some, mm -hmm. some pretty great web art based around the floppy. It's also very close to T1. Joni, can you play it? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Can we start it from the beginning?
So we love this film when we saw it in 2020. We've worked with Han over the last little while as we've been experimenting with different types of small file um, aesthetics. Um, and Han and I were on a conference panel together. So we got to thinking about like the question that we've been asking ourselves more and more as we've been jurying for the next festival, but also um, as we're working with artists is what does the small file constraint add or take away aesthetically? Um, because, you know, um, our operations manager, Joey, who's in the room here, has come and done workshops in my first year classes. Um, and uh, something, sometimes with the first year students, something that they take away is that why would you try to compress when you can already do the sweetest thing? Um, so in this sense, we wanted to think about what is compression adding or in what ways does it contribute? So for Han Pham's film, I think it adds something almost narratively because what we're seeing is uh, Vietnamese children's television from when Han grew up in Vietnam, but sort of layered over the still image of her pandemic era bedroom. And there is this sense of the ways in which um, we were all sort of dissipating in that lockdown moment. And that's what the compression blurriness does tend to add in an aesthetic way. The next, um, I'm sorry, I keep talking. I'll show you one more example. This is the world premiere of uh, Tahigan Blue Skies, We Hate Stuff. We're gonna show it at this year's festival. I just wanted to show you something that's kind of like fun to watch. Go to hell. And why is that? And you're not allowed to be on another planet. Well, don't we need the number 18 for science and math and things? Because the number 18 is a very unlucky. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
you're the first to screen this. It will be at our festival in 2024 <laughs> in October. Um, just like as a way to segue into more web art, we worked with um, organizers of the Photographer's Gallery in the UK to, order, to organize the first small file photography festival. That happened in early 2023. Um, you can have a look at some of these stats on the local network and we'll post this to the small file website so you can review it later. Um, but I wanted to show you some examples of things that photographers were doing because of the ways in which, like, I, what did the stat I said was something like, the first photo, that it, the first image on the web appeared 30 years ago, it was 12 kilobytes. Now the average size of an image on the internet is uh, 2,100 kilobytes or 2.1 megabytes. And 80% of web traffic consists of visual material contributing to this 4% or 4.8% um, number that is really difficult to fathom. It's something like uses up more electricity than it takes to circumnavigate the globe several times. Um, so these are some examples of artists who are working using obsolete technology. Um, this isn't quite obsolete, but it is 35 millimeter photography. Um, and they have played with the pixels in order to create what I think is like a very satisfying visual image. Um, below, if you keep scrolling, this is artist Tanya Boyarkina. If we keep scrolling below, these are uh, Sophie Sherwood. I believe she won the festival using a Game Boy camera. Um, and these are six kilobytes each. Um, and they're actually portraits of herself when she was a teenager, portraits of herself and her friend. And then last but not least, Lauren Mason. So something that we see a lot in the Small File Media Festival as well as in the Photography Festival are artists who are working with found footage. So these are images or thumbnails that she took off of eBay and then compressed. So this one's titled Dress to Compress, a thumbnail of a thumbnail. <laughs> Um, and then these are, this is an artist who's taken something in the, that already exists and then used Photoshop to scale down. So this is definitely just uh, examples of artists who are just working with this uh, idea of what does it mean to start small rather than, you know, something we see frequently is artists who start large and then compress to size. That is a great segue. Um, I'm just going to skip right to the end, right away. Uh, so this is kind of a workshop format, uh, or it was intended to be. Um, there's a lot of resources, and this next section is really sort of like information and, and resource heavy. Might be a little dry, uh, but I just wanted to skip to the end and just show we're doing sort of an interactive aspect of this, um, where folks. Um, you know, if you like to multitask or if you want to skip ahead, if you want to play around with image compression, if you have experience with web development and you want to make a basic HTML site um, that fits the requirements of what I've sort of put together as being a small file website, um, you can share it on the local network um, for others to see throughout the day. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out before I get started. Can you just say the local network address again? Uh, yeah, so it's... Arnett. Yeah, it's the archives local one here. Okay. Do you guys have a favorite thing for creating a long page site? You see, I'm handbrake as an example, but htmx.org is really good. Uh, it's really easy to do a long page site as well. And yeah. htmx.org. We are also uh, in development to produce an app that will allow compression offline. So that's our, that's our big project for the coming year. You know, there's lots of tools already for that, right? I'm not, I'm, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll connect to you uh, with our uh, production managers taking care of that. Um, so yeah, I've kind of put this together uh, in a way that um, is accessible for people who uh, have kind of all levels of technical um, abilities. Um, I believe in sort of a uh, you know, bottom-up approach to pretty much any kind of education or any kind of um, uh, really skills that help us with common everyday things. I think web is becoming one of those things that not only do we have the technology for it to be an accessible um, uh, medium for people to create. I mean, we have drag and drop platforms. What you see is what you get platforms. Like, 
Squarespace, Cargo, Wix, all of those. I think that says a lot about where we're at with web and how it can become a much more um, accessible format, especially in sort of a folk web sense, in the sense of keeping in mind this, yeah? If you want to access the files for this page, you actually are accessing it from your file manager, not from the browser. So first be on the local network. Um, so it's our local network. That's the SSID you want to choose. And then the password is all lowercase sunflower. Then, because it's shared um, via Samba, like open your file manager. But actually, all the instructions, depending on the operating system, is on archives.lan. So, Get on the local network, open your browser, type archives.local, scroll all the way to the bottom, and those are the instructions um, that use the same information that Joni shared. Sorry. No, all good. Uh, we're, we're figuring this out as we go. Um, websites, small file websites are actually kind of a new, uh, newer concept, I mean, for the small file media festival. Um, we've you know, obviously, the media festival itself is primarily uh, film and video. Um, we've had submissions in the past that are web-based uh, or um, uh, you know non-video based or image based, um, but this is you know our first time or my first time sort of leaning into this aspect of this of the small website. Uh, I joined Small File Media Festival last year, so fairly late. Um, I wasn't really aware of. Uh, any kind of festival that, that sort of leaned into the small file aesthetic and uh, with, you know, with the perspective, with the angle of, of uh, being eco-conscious in how we make art. And uh, as somebody who, in my web development uh, business or practice, I work a lot with artists and galleries for um, really um, bespoke projects um, with not a lot of precedent. Very experimental websites, many of them single page websites. There is always talk about it being small, easy to load on phones, low data usage, accessible. Um, but I didn't put that much thought into these, um, these efforts also being uh, sort of envi an environmental um, benefit. Uh, and now especially learning a lot more about the statistics around uh, information technologies, uh, carbon footprint, uh, I think it's kind of imperative. And I've now sort of started to work it into the way I make websites. Um, so the concept of small footprint uh, or small file web design has gained traction uh, with the rise of mobile inter internet usage, people using data, and growing awareness of inf environmental impacts. Early web pages in the 1990s, as, uh, as Yanni was talking about, older technology was naturally lightweight, just technological limitations. I mean, what was the, the communications software for the Apollo was like? a few kilobytes or something like that. Um, and yet, you know, a, a website now, commonly used websites like meta websites, Instagram or Facebook or something like that are several megabytes per page that you're loading, not to mention images that are being loaded, et cetera. Uh, and this has a huge impact, of course. Um, and so web, it, part of this is, is because of, again, the fidelity of, of content that is served and also sort of demanded uh, and also the complexity of, of the web technology. Um, so, yeah, of course, everybody uses the internet. Everybody has a phone, almost. People use data, uh, data all the time. Uh, uh, this statistic here, 3.7%, is sort of within that range that we were talking about, about 4% of uh, global emissions, which is more than the aviation industry. Um, and some experts say it's predicted to double next year with sort of uh, you know more commonplace um, high resolution images or 4K media uh, being streamed and that kind of streaming is a huge huge part of that. Um, yeah, so the median f uh, file size of a web page you can check this out on httparchive.org. It's a great resource to check historical statistics of the web. Uh, even only since 2010, it was about half a kilobyte on average, and has gone up to almost three uh, megabytes per page uh, on a website. Um, so you know that multiplication when it comes to carbon output is huge. Um, so standards for reduction and de-bloating on the web 
uh, that are, are common. You find articles, you find resources around how to make your website smaller and more efficient. I find most of these get close, but they're not quite it because their focus, uh, it tends to be on web efficiency, it tends to be on uh, search engine optimization, these sorts of concerns, and not so much the environmental concern. And I think this goes for small file uh, videos, this goes for web, all art forms, kind of anything in our life. There has to be, in order to actually represent that small, uh, that sort of like permaculture um, standard, there has to be sacrifices that has to be made. There are certain um, aspects, I'll, I'll stick to web, because I can talk about basically anything when it comes to this, but. Um, we don't need them. They're not necessary. Uh, so, yeah, small file websites intend to go up beyond these sorts of like surface level efforts to design and develop front end websites. Um, small footprint web art refers to web content designed uh, to use minimal resources, minimal resources in terms of bandwidth, storage, and processing power. This includes extremely optimized fi uh, file sizes efficient coding practices, streamlined design elements, but uh, most importantly demands a willingness to forego many of the advances of, in web technology that emphasize comfort over efficiency, such as um, sort of bloating of websites uh, through external libraries, you know, these sort of additional features uh, like data tracking features like cookies, webhooks, that kind of thing, global server access as opposed to local server access, high definition media as opposed to compressed low definition media, legible images uh, using uh, superfluous sort of design elements like uh, high file size fonts or additional fonts that are needed. Uh, and of course, reliable access altogether is, is something that people would just assume is what we would have with web, but um, is something that we you know, may have to give up in order to um, lower that 4% number. Uh, in this case, uh, what is it, La Low Tech Mag is a good example of this. Their website is solar powered. They actually have a battery meter on the website. If it's cloudy, nighttime, whatever, if it runs out of battery, the site goes down. And they're pretty nonchalant about it. That's just how it is. Uh, this makes a big impact in terms of the uh, power usage for, for servers. And um, it's not a big deal. You just access the website later. So these are the sort of sacrifices that I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, benefits of small, uh, small files, faster load times, great on low, uh, slow internet collect connections, but also low infrastructure, um, uh, like reg regions where you might have little to no network, you might have 2G uh, data network connection and that kind of thing. Um, obviously web is the main use uh, when it comes to data usage on phones, um, and it's really important when it comes to information dissemination, being able to access websites even on the, the, the lowest uh, or, or the, um, the worst possible network is, is extremely important. And so these are just sort of side effects of this um, small file effort. Um, reducing the amount of data transferred. Um, so I figured I'd start off with some examples because this, this is all pretty dry. Um, unfortunately, I'm not connected to the internet because I'm adhering to the philosophies of our networks here. Uh, I do have a couple websites here to show, just to give you a sense of how small I'm talking. And we're talking in the context of web art here. I think the reason web art is important is, it, like art in general, like small file media art, is it encourages experimentation and encourages people to think outside of the box in a way that, you know, a website that is simply for practical use might not. Um, and it gets us um, thinking and it gets, uh, it gets things moving in terms of how we can experiment and how we can make things make our website smaller. Um, so a lot of you probably know about Endless Horse. Uh, this website is, I think it's like, it's under 10 kilobytes. And this website is just an endless horse. <laughs> it is exactly what it says it is, which is also kind of a tenant of small file websites. No bells and whistles. It's exactly what it says it is. We also love to be funny. It's, humor <laughs> is really, really important. I won't speak for everyone, but when it comes to art, when it comes to life, humor is really, really important. Um, this website is uh, a, a fairly conceptual art piece. This was sent in by uh, an individual, oh, uh, Ortiz uh, Alicio, uh, sent in for this year's festival, actually. Um, we don't really have the infrastructure yet to be able to present 
web works, but I uh, figured I would show this. I'll get into the aesthetics in a bit. Um, this website was uh, the sort of Flickr photo stream for the US border, uh, Customs and Border Protection, which had 15,000 photos. Uh, and the idea was that it is sort of breaking that linkage, um, creating this sort of offline website and these broken uh, image links. Um, and this is it. This is the whole website. It's a single page, plain text, no additional fonts, several kilobytes. Um, I'll just show some, some photos of some artists that are working with web. Uh, this is Raphael Rosendahl. Um, this artist has a, a number of websites actually that are worth checking out. They're very, they're very visual, they're very screen savory, but I think they're really interesting in terms of what can be done without using traditional image files. All of these shapes are created using code. Uh, and using code in that sense is, creates an incredibly small website um, with some interesting, spectacular, flashy imagery. Uh, there is a conceptual basis for these. You can read about it on, on their website, but they have many, many of these websites. This is a screenshot because I don't have an internet connection. <laughs> so these are just screenshots. The code is either SVG or using CSS purely right. to create these images. Uh, and then Petra Courtright is a pretty famous artist that uses web uh, digital technologies and performance art. This is their actual website. It uses a primarily system fonts and emojis. Uh, motherfucking website is a motherfucking website. <laughs> it, it's a website about over-designing websites. It's actually kind of the perfect website for this presentation. It's very cheeky, but it talks a lot about how these sort of like design trends and this competition around, uh, you know, you know, web design as a business and um, needing to sort of like push the boundaries, push the limits technologically, is a problem. And it talks about how this is a website, and it's great. And this is all you need. It's just text and a white background, a few kilobytes. And then this was input output. Uh, this was sort of a collection of um, tools that you can use to convert, calculate, et cetera. But it was created by this artist whose actual name I'm forgetting, but it's endtimes.dev. Their interest in web is creating websites under 14 kilobytes, which is so absolutely tiny, especially for functional websites like this. So this is a great example of a really, really functional website, really useful website that's negligible in data, data size. It's basically nothing. Uh, 14 kilobytes is, uh, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> um, so folk web refers to a DIY approach to web development. Oh, sorry, there was one more here. This is just the world's highest website. Uh, it's 11.77 <laughs> miles. It broke world records, but that's the whole website. <laughs> also, also very cheeky. Um, yeah, folk, folk web refers to a DIY approach to web development that uh, emphasizes simplicity, creativity, accessibility, uh, among other things. It often involves using basic web, basic web technologies and old technologies, or out, what we consider outmoded technologies in innovative ways without relying on heavy frameworks or extensive libraries, and using uh, platforms and frameworks that are often seen as outmoded. All right, skip to head. Folk web movement values content and functionality. Uh, over aesthetic complexity. It encourages uh, creators to focus on what really matters to their audience, the simplest tools available to deliver that content. F uh, small file web art basically attempts to take that philosophy and actually lean into the aesthetic complexity or the aesthetic uh, the, you know, um, priority while keeping these sort of tendencies like small, small file sizes and uh, using old technologies. This is extremely difficult, which is why it's important. Um, let's see. Yeah, so there's sort of an aesthetic concern when it comes to these kinds of things. And this, you could say this about a lot of different uh, technologies where people bounce off of it. People are less likely to want to make uh, these sorts of sacrifices when they see the aesthetics of small file websites. They're seen as lowbrow, amateurish, sloppy, and especially when using uh, highly compressed images, for example, or extremely compressed videos. People's uh, you know, sort of innate reaction tends to be that it's poorly made or it's amateurish. Um, this is also an effort to sort of normalize these aesthetics uh, 
and make people not react in such a visceral way to them uh, and sort of get to a place where it's more commonplace and more acceptable to have really messy, awful, compressed images for the sake of the environment and for the sake of data usage. Uh, so based on what I researched and what I've seen, small file websites should be no longer than 250 kilobytes. If you go online, there's a 250 kilobyte club. You can find websites that are 250 kilobytes or lower, a whole list of them. It's a huge accolade for a lot of people. Uh, but with a principled approach, um, strict align design uh, philosophy, and I would say you know, some technical skills and research, you can create useful, spectacular, accessible websites uh, that are 15 kilobytes or lower, as, you, as we've seen. But I'd say the standard is 250 kilobytes or lower for the entire project. Um, I have a lot of information here that is just sort of like basic surface level HTML and CSS uh, JavaScript. I don't think I want to go through it necessarily in detail, but it's there if people want to sort of like create their own. You can do this in a text document, save it as a .html file, use uh, the image um, tag to add your image. At the very bottom of this page, there's a resources section. There are links to two PDFs. One is a cheat sheet for CSS tags. One is a cheat sheet for HTML tags. So you can play around with that, make something really, really simple, and you can share it to that. Uh, or you can just share your images, ASCII art, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so HTML is the standard, uh, standard language for web pages. Very important, foundational. Uh, it's, it structures all of the information. Um, CSS, cascading style sheets, is what styles the information, gives it that look, gives it the styling that it needs or doesn't need. Uh, efficient CSS can uh, greatly reduce, or inefficient CSS can greatly increase the size of web pages. Um, you can also um, add CSS inline on an HTML file instead of uh, accessing it externally, which can also help. Uh, I'll get more into what we can do with the actual code to make the website smaller. Uh, of course, JavaScript is the sort of standard for um, external scripting uh, alongside HTML. Uh, it's embedded within it, and it can be used to modify HTML elements in the DOM uh, or in the list of elements that have been loaded onto the page, and also CSS dynamically even after the web page is loaded. Um, so JavaScript is used um, to do things that basically like vanilla HTML and CSS won't do. It's really useful for interaction and to you know, do mo pretty much any website you're using now is using a JavaScript library or at least some sort of JavaScript to make it work. But part of this small, small file website philosophy is not using, a, uh, not using too much JavaScript and not using any external JavaScript libraries. So all JavaScript should be uh, proprietary, it should be inline, and it should be as small as possible if it's being used. Um, and then we have JSON, of course, which is uh, a notation language, a data interchange format that's easy for writing. It's good for, great for organizing information uh, in a specific uh, sort of data set. Um, great for exchanging data uh, across local networks, across non-local networks, and uh, for any website that basically uses some kind of like text database. Um, Markdown is a markup language that's easy to read and write. It's often used for formatting readme files, writing messages, online discussion forums, create rich text. This can be useful um, in terms of creating notes uh, for your project. Uh, all of these languages can be used basically anywhere. Uh, keeping documents in plain text, they are lightweight and universally access accessible. This means documents in web design and development are easier to edit and manage and accessible and open on any device. Uh, yeah. So static ends in bottom-up web development. Static uh, website is, okay. Static website is made up of a number of pre-built files stored on a system or server as opposed to a dynamic website. All small file websites are static websites. We're not using dynamic libraries. We're not dynamically accessing information from an external server while using the website. The website is loaded into the cache. The website can be used offline if needed. Um, uh, client side. 
when the user requests a page from the server, the server turns the HTML file as specified by the URL and all the other files uh, in the context of small file websites. Static sites are definitely the way to go. They do not rely on server-side processing, which you know in itself is additional energy usage, uh, but are also accessible, can be accessible offline, saved offline, and are also smaller, faster, more reliable, and more energy efficient. Uh, and they can be uh, easily hosted locally or on any server. Um, so in terms of media compression, uh, this is stuff most people already know here. So we have JPEGs, really, really lossy format, um, decent legibility, but can be really, really pushed to the limit in terms of compression. They're really important in that sense because you can really take uh, a high color image, high detail image, and really, really push it to its compression limits if that's what you need to do. But we have PNGs, which of course can be a little bigger, but uh, or actually quite, quite a lot bigger. Um, with small file websites, it's best not to use file formats with uh, transparency, specifically P PNG, because it's a lossless format. It's very big. Uh, GIFs, of course, you can use animation. Animation is also not great. Uh, alternatives to, to GIFs or GIF files is uh, sprite sheets, where you essentially have one single very compressed image. It's used, it's used in old video games, uh, currently used in two-dimensional uh, 2D video games, where you basically have one image with every single frame on it. And the CSS, in a very basic way, just moves the frames along and makes it look animated. It's much smaller. Uh, the nice thing about GIFs is you can lower the colors, the number of colors. Um, it's limited color palette to 56 colors. You can go down to two. This will lower the file size significantly and also can create a really, really interesting look in terms of uh, web, uh, image compression, web compression. And then WebP is a fairly new format uh, intended for web. WebP files are a better compression than JPEG and PNG. They're really versatile. Uh, and they also have transparency benefits and can be used as containers for compressed video animation, that kind of thing. They're really, really versatile. They have really decent um, compression, but I find that the, the control over these files is not as good. Uh, there's image compression methods in here, like GIMP Photoshop, GIMP being the free version, uh, offline software, MS Paint. The small file sort of, thanks, uh, the small file sort of uh, philosophy is to use technologies that are either built into your operating system, experiment, play around. MS Paint, classic. Built into Windows, uh, there are also online versions, very small. Word processors, Microsoft Word, Pages, they often have built-in image compression uh, features. If you're in a pinch and you're offline, those are a great way to, to make it happen. Data moshing, uh, you can do a lot with data moshing if you know what you're doing, but if you just want to experiment, you can get some interesting results. There's a lot of different ways to data mosh, opening image files in a text editor and removing or manipulating data, opening image files in a audio editor like Audacity, free and open source, uh, and editing the, way, uh, the sound files and saving as an image. If you remove the data, of course, it makes the file smaller. Um, so you can play around with that as well. Command line compression is just sort of a way to use some of these other programs like ImageMagick to get a little more control over what you're doing. Uh, there's online tools. I'm, uh, what's that? That's here for FFmpeg. Yeah, an FFmpeg, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not even gonna talk about online tools because those are basically a backup. We don't wanna use online tools. Uh, and then hex editors. If you know anything about hex editing, it's a great way to do it. Okay, so I just wanna get into the alternatives here and then maybe I'll let it go. Take questions, yeah. Um, Great alternatives that are negligible in size if you want to use images on your website, which of course you would if you're making small file web art. Uh, and this is one of the sort of main differences and main challenges in difference to just a website with text versus one that you want to have visuals on. So CSS art, similar to the image I showed before, is creating visuals using only CSS, uh, the style sheets I was talking about before. So you're basically just using code and saying, create a square, add a gradient, create another square, et cetera and it'll add up to this. This is purely CSS, this is not an image, and it weighs about 350 bytes. And it's also scalable infinitely. Uh, SVGs, of course, are vector files, uh, great for making uh, simple and often complex uh, illustrations. Uh, similar to CSS art that's web friendly, made up of vector graphics, so it's scalable infinitely. Uh, it uses, of course, 
points, lines, curves, and shapes that are based on math mathematical formulas instead of pixels. Uh, this is much less information, much smaller. This little floppy disk here, two kilobytes. You can scale it to the, to the moon if you wanted to, still two kilobytes. ASCII illustrations, very retro, uh, very nostalgic, and take up about the same amount of file size, or um, amount of bytes as, as you know, any other amount of text, one character, one byte. Uh, it also has a really interesting aesthetic appeal uh, and can be exploited to sort of like create uh, websites that use image and text that coalesces uh, aesthetically uh, and play around with uh, uh, text as image. Sorry, I'm, I'm rushing through this because we don't have a lot of time, so pardon me. And then the last one here that I'm presenting as, as an alternative is pixel art. Here we're using traditional via file types, JPEG, um, PNG, except this file is 10 by 10 pixels. In its normal size, it would I don't think you'd be able to see it on the screen here, or barely, and we just have it scaled up. Because it's pixel art, it's clean pixels, it's going to scale that way. 214 bytes, super negligible. You can use a lot of different colors. You can create a lot of different shapes. And if you look again at 8-bit or 16-bit graphics from history in video games, et cetera, you can do a lot to illustrate uh, a scene or create uh, interesting artwork. Uh, I think I don't have any time left. Does anybody have any questions so far? Five minutes? Yeah, does anybody have any questions at all? Um, so video, just real quick. MP4 is the way to go for video for web. It, similar to JPEG, is, is really versatile in terms of compression. Uh, WebM is oftentimes even better, but MP4 is the way to go. MKV, AVI, MOV, not great for web. And these are some compression basics. <laughs> What's that? I don't understand why you would make those suggestions. I would make them in the exact opposite order. Okay. Um, MP4 is fraught with patents. Yes. On H.264 and a bunch of other stuff, which prevents a great number of open source tools from really using it. Yeah. Um, uh, WebM is um, a variation of Matroska that Google likes and does not want to standardize. So it could change rapidly. And you Google could dislikes. Find Pardon me? Google dislikes. No, they love it. It's their protocol. Okay. Okay, and so you can kind of expect it to change in incompatible ways that essentially amount to download the latest Chrome and you'll be fine. But um, don't use your files from last year because it's a problem. Um, uh, whereas Matroska is now the subject of an IETF standards effort, which is that close from minutes away from the RFC being out. Um, and has great, huge support from 2002 on, and uh, has a lot of interesting things that you can do. So I would have said it in the exact opposite way. Um, so my focus here is more about file sizes and data accessibility. Of course, you always have these conflicting um, concerns when it comes to web access. There's, like you said, there's um, patents, there's um, privacy. Our focus just right now is, uh, has to do with file sizes and data accessibility. MP4s are much better, or you know, they're pretty equal in terms of compression, but Matroska Video MKV isn't as supported in web browsers currently, and so that's why I suggest MP4. But I do like MKV a lot more. It's sort of the free video, um, video format. It's royalty free, it's unpatented, um, and I think it is becoming a lot more supported. So I do agree with you on that in that sense, but that is why I went started with MP4. Um, WebM, similarly, just because it is a standard, but I do note here that it is less supported and these sorts of uh, limitations in terms of um, browsers, patents, that kind of thing. It's explicitly not a standard. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Google proprietary things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just mean, I mean, I, I think we definitely should move away from that, but these are just what are, is being used and what is smallest in that sense. For example, MOV is, of course, an Apple for, um, codec, an Apple uh, file format. Uh, it's awful. Uh, huge, 
not, ex not uh, compatible, et cetera, and not great for web. One of the things that we're just trying to prioritize at Small File is accessibility, and not everybody has the, the knowledge or tools, but we hopefully can raise that with our platform too and make these uh, formats more popular. We work with this idea of a philosophy of imminence, meaning what is available, what materials do we have to work with, and what do we do with them? And so our political intervention is to say, okay, like maybe yes, maybe, maybe we want to avoid uh, certain multinational conglomerates. We're super critical of Alphabet, for instance. But this is material that's available for us to use. So we're telling people, we're telling our students, we're working with artists to say, okay, explain it. What can you do? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. But much, much, <laughs> yeah. Much better said. Thank you. Hi. Um, you talk a lot about compression and you know file formats and stuff, but what about other methods of like reducing file size, like dithering or like lower colors and stuff like that? Yeah. So thanks. Sorry, I, I really, um, I feel like I had to rush through a lot of this. There's a, little, a lot more information, content, and resources in this document. Um, but yeah, we'll say J JPEGs uh, and GIFs um, are, and anything that uses a, sort of a, bi a bitmap uh, uh, format is highly customizable in terms of the way that you uh, not only compress it, but in terms of the way it looks. And you can kind of balance this compression and aesthetic aspects when you're making uh, visual art with it. Um, my focus here is more on the broad strokes, uh, just so I can get through this. I will say there are also sort of some additional like file reduction techniques when it comes to web. This is not exhaustive by any means. And I think it's something that um, there are still a lot of experimental ways to, to uh, reduce these size, uh, sizes and a lot of ways that people aren't talking about. Um, but lazy image loading is one. These are sort of user side. Um, uh, techniques where an image doesn't load unless it's scrolled into view. This way you're not loading it immediately off the top of the page. A lot of people don't ever scroll down to certain images and media. That will save. Uh, however, with small file websites, we want the entire page regardless to be a certain file size because we want to be able to save it. We want to be able to share it as well. Um, user interaction uh, content loading. For example, if you have images or videos uh, embedded in a website, you can use just a, one or two lines of code to uh, prevent that content from loading immediately and user consent to load it, where you click the image, click the video, and then it will load. This is just another way that uh, maybe the initial loading of the page is small, accessible on phones, et cetera, but um, can, be, can be dug further into. Uh, reusing assets. Uh, if you're just learning web development or, or web design, you might not realize that yeah, you can reuse assets, reuse videos, uh, other media images on the same page. It only needs to load it once. So if you're looking to make web art, you can use that to your advantage in order to sort of lean into this aesthetic of repetition um, while not raising the file size at all. Code calling, aside from the lines of code that you need to do it. Uh, code calling, of course, you want to go through every single line of your code and make sure you're removing any line of code that is not necessary, notes, um, and trying to make the code as efficient as possible. This can make even just kilobytes of difference, but it makes a difference. And that's how we get down to those 15 kilobyte marks is every single character counts, right? Minification is a great way to do this. Minification could be used with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and JSON as well, uh, which redu uh, gets rid of line breaks and spaces and basically makes all the code on one line. Those line breaks and spaces can take up many, many kilobytes of data, and it can actually drastically reduce the file size. So these are also other ways we can make the website more efficient. Um, I, my suggestion, just ending off here, when it comes to images and not text in web, is leaning away from the JPEG and the, the PNG, the actual image formats, and leaning into 
these more code-based or ASCII art or text-based even, or possibly forgoing the media altogether and just working with text. I think 250 kilobytes is a great standard. I think we should try to get down to 15 kilobytes for our websites. A um, lot of great resources at the bottom of the page, a lot of great re uh, research. If anyone has any questions, you can in email info at smallfile.ca. I can get into more detail about specifically web art, not just web development when it comes to small files. I just wanted to say too, just with this idea like of compression, that we talk about compression first because it's the easiest way for us to talk to people who don't typically work in media art to say, okay, like start large and work small. But as we are jurying our festival, we're seeing a lot of big movies that were made for big purposes and then compressed so that we can show them to spec in our festival. And we're not accepting uh, entries like that so much anymore. So we are trying to think about like there's so much that we don't know aesthetically about what could be done with a small file constraint. Like we are still learning all the time. Um, what artists can do in terms of pushing compression or rather minimalism to its limit. And I recognize that we are sort of like asking you to work like a cult, like to believe in our movement and to say, okay, like just, just be austere for austerity's sake for now. And we are hoping it will pay off. Thank you to Yanni and Joni. Can we give them a round of applause?